So somebody asked a question about Rangers. Uh, Rangers are not part of Special Forces. It is part of the infantry, if you will. The 75th Regiment, Ranger Regiment, is part of the Special Ops community, in a sense. But they conduct raids. Uh, before Delta Force was instituted, they would do, uh, they were trained at taking down large, uh, like complexes, oil rigs, things like that. They have three separate battalions spread throughout the United States. One's at Fort Lewis, Washington. One's at Fort Stewart, Georgia. I think the others moved to Fort Campbell, Kentucky now. They are an integral part of the Special Ops Force. Um, back in the days before the brigade combat team format of deployment, uh, a scenario would be, say, the 7th Division uh, needed to go in and create a lodgement and airhead in the country. You'd find a battalion of the Rangers. If, if the analysis of the threat said a battalion could do it, a battalion of Rangers would be airdropped in under cover of darkness. They'd secure airhead objectives around the airfield, create a, usually be a, an area suitable for landing that you could bring C-130s in, and then a combat assault would follow up, bringing an infantry, light infantry brigade and expand the lodgement. And you got a larger, they'd be a brand larger aircraft like C-5 because the C-17 was just coming in the inventory back then. Um, they could then bring in armored vehicles and such as the, as the mission would escalate. The Rangers traced their lineage back to the Revolutionary War with Roberts Rangers. Um, question. We're, we're talking about kind of insurgency and counterinsurgency and guerrilla warfare. Any idea how far back guerrilla warfare goes? Native Americans, you think? Further back than that, actually. It actually goes back to basically the dawn of civilization and tribal warfare because insurgent or guerrilla type operation and rangers are well suited for counterinsurgency, as is our whole special ops community. That people wearing uniforms that aren't uniforms, blended with the terrain, hitting where the enemy is not strong, taking out psychological targets, targets that are of, of opportunity, convoys, it could be a wagon train movement through the forest or whatever. That was the thing in the Revolutionary War, is why the Roberts Rangers were so effective, is they used cover and concealment, they used blended in with the terrain. You think back to the Revolutionary War, what did the British wear? Remember what they used? Well, right, yeah. The red coats. You know. Okay, you're walking through a forest wearing white pants and a red coat. That to me is a pretty good target. Something else that, that our guerrilla forces, the Rangers did, is they went after the officers. You know, the old thing cut off the head of the snake and they'll ride it around, but you've killed the snake. And that was considered by the British to be not, not gentlemanly. You're killing our leaders. Duh. <laughs> That's what you wanted. I mean, if, if you're going to take a weapon and try to kill someone, then do it, right? Prosecute the battle. It's kind of like in a, in a sporting contest. If you're in a football game, ideally, you want to vanquish your opponent in the first quarter. Basically, put them down on the ground, figuratively speaking, put their foot on, your foot <laughs> on their throat, subdue them, and say, are you ready to quit? You lift up your heel and let them talk a little bit. I mean, you want to win. Vanquish. You, know, you don't want a close victory. That uh, if you look at what we did in Panama, we sent an overwhelming force down to take over that country. You win. The British had these, <laughs> they wanted to fight us in, a, in the old Napoleonic style. Robert, <coughs> Rogers, Rangers, some simple rules, keep your powder dry, make sure you got the amount, appropriate amount of lead, don't forget nothing, never leave a comrade behind. Elements of, of, uh, of uh, military training that are still prevalent today, don't leave anybody behind. Uh, I don't know if you saw, I can't think of his name, it's with 173rd Army Medal of Honor in Afghanistan. They were on a patrol. Uh, his name escapes me right now. First name was Salvatore Sal, it was an E5. They were coming back from a patrol and they got hit. And while they were recovering from this, the 
insurgents started to drag away wounded Americans. And he was not on my watch. He went out and killed the guys that were trying to drag the Americans away and brought them back to safety. He was wounded, didn't realize it. He received the Congressional Medal of Honor for that. And like many Medal of Honor winners, he felt he was just doing his job. There are other people that probably should have gotten recognized more than him. Um, had, had any of you ever met a Medal of Honor winner in person? I had the opportunity to be at a uh, kind of a social function after a main function. And I was invited up to a, a host room. And there were four Medal of Honor winners in that room. I didn't know it. The most unassuming, easygoing gentleman you'd ever find. They were just to a man, just doing my job type of thing. Anyway, um, Ranger tactics and techniques uh, can be company and battalion size. Uh, to be in a Ranger regiment, you can enlist in the Army for the Ranger option. You have to have a high ASFAB score, which have you guys taken the ASFAB yet? You'll be taking, okay. When you take that, you start scoring high, you're going to be hit by all the recruiters going to start calling and wanting to talk to you. And listen carefully to what they offer because can, I know my son scored high and everybody in the world would want that. We can give you this, we can give you that. So well, I want to go to college. And recruiters kind of backed off at that point. Um, you have to have a high GT score in order to go to um, special ops, rangers, or those who enlist for the Ranger option will go to, uh, it's called OSIT, one station unit training for basic and advanced individual training, normally at Fort Bain, Georgia. From there, they go to airborne school and get jump qualified. And from there, then they go to the whatever part of the Ranger regiment, they go to a Ranger training program. Get the, they learn the, the essentials of what a Ranger is. By the time they finally send them to the Ranger school, it's really more of validation of what they've learned. The Ranger regiment's attitude is, we're not gonna send anybody from a Ranger regiment to a school that they can't pass. Ranger school is a very demanding school. It's, uh, um, they can't shoot at you with live rounds, so they stress you out by uh, fatiguing you out. Uh, it's not, it's not unusual to lose 20 to 30 pounds when you go through Ranger School because you're down to one meal a day. You are um, incredibly intense um, operations tempo. The first three weeks you go through and you learn basic patrolling uh, uh, techniques, what a patrol leader is, assistant patrol leader, different elements of a patrol, techniques, land navigation. Uh, the only place you'll find a more demanding land navigation course is when you get into Special Forces or Delta Force. Um, and then you go out and patrol. If you, since you're more qualified, you'll make jumps and they'll uh, start the mission planning process and they might go, your patrol leader, your assistant patrol leader, start planning. And you do all the planning and briefing and start moving. Just as you start to move, you get killed and you get killed. And now you're the patrol leader, you're the assistant patrol leader. Now you're a squad, you're just a squad member. Because it makes sure everyone is aware of what's going on. You make the plan, you've got to execute it. Then when you get up to close to the objective, you start your leader's recon. They kill those guys, quote unquote, put them back in as snuffies. And so you can get several different evaluations of people on one patrol. And then you'll, it might be an ambush, it could be a raid, it could be just a, a strictly intel gathering operation, who knows. After the first three weeks, and there's other things, there's the confidence course, the slide for life. I don't know if you've ever watched the Discovery Channel, it shows a show making the cut, and there's a 40-foot uh, obstacle. It's, it's like a two by 12 with a couple steps in it. You're 40 feet above water with no safety net. You walk along, you gotta step up, step down, and go out, you crawl up. Uh, along a rope, and there's a ranger tab you hang, you ask permission to drop, you drop it in the water, and it's, it's also seen if you're afraid of the water. And then they've got a slide for life, it's zip line. It's not quite, maybe 150 feet long from, again, about 50 feet up, you slide down, you go in the water. There's obstacle courses, uh, the confidence course and such. Um, after the first phase of ranger school, then you get a, about an eight hour cycle break. That's where you can, Sleep if you want, eat if you want, you're on your own. You have to be report back at a certain time. They bus you up to northern Georgia to an area called Dahlonega, Georgia, and you learn military mountaineering, uh, rappelling, how to create a Swiss seat out of a piece of rope to 
could safely repel down and also climb up um, um, the cliffs and such. Um, excuse me. Once you're done with the military mountaineering part, learning that, then again, more patrolling, patrolling in a mountainous environment. So up the ridge, down the ridge, up the ridge, down the ridge, and it's again, it's all worked at wearing you out. After those three weeks, you go down to Florida for the Florida phase, the jungle phase. And it's interesting, uh, Fort Benning, the terrain contour in the bowl is about 10 meters. The Dahlonega, it's like 100 meters. And in Florida, it's one meter, it's just flat. In Florida phase, you're almost never dry. You're in the swamps the whole time. You're learning about water tactics, uh, RV7s, a rubber boat, seven man rubber boat. You learn more about uh, uh, how to navigate um, on land and water, and then you put together a large, it's a counter drug operation, so all type of counter insurgency. Yes? This is all in ranger school? This is all ranger school, so yeah. And that's where our patrolling techniques are really honed and come from, is at uh, U.S. Army Ranger School. It's open to other branches. Uh, I was there with, there were Marines, and there were some uh, Air Force PJs that were going to ranger school. And uh, you'll occasionally find folks from the Navy also. It teaches a lot of self-confidence, small unit tactics, how to do a lot with not much. And it's, uh, it's, a, it's a darn good school. They really don't have an honor graduate as such. Usually when you go through a school, there's honor gra If you graduate, and you know, that's, that's pretty noteworthy. Um, and the intent of the Army is that you'll have Ranger qualified folks at every squad level in every combat arms unit. You're never gonna reach that, but you can be ranger qualified and not be in a ranger unit. Um, you can also be in a ranger unit and not be ranger qualified. Uh, a lot of folks will go, like if you're enlisted, you can go right to the regiment and then eventually go to school and you can spend a long career in a ranger regiment. Uh, <coughs> For an officer, you come as a cadet, a lot of Army <coughs> cadets go to, I think they cut that, I, I correct myself, used to be in, in lieu of the uh, summer leadership course between your junior and senior year, you could go to ranger school. But most all officers who choose to go to ranger school are allowed to go to ranger school after their basic branch or in conjunction with that, they'll go to ranger school. And then they go back to whatever unit they're assigned to. I ran into finance lieutenants who were ranger qualified, AG lieutenants who were, you know, it's not just combat arms. Um, but patrolling techniques, can, a patrol can be as small as a squad, and large as a battalion, really. And the intent is you're given an area to go to, an objective, set up an ambush. <coughs> Sometimes when you're given a mission for a patrol, you don't, you're not sure of the big picture. It's you move from point A to point B without being detected, uh, set up an ambush at this point, set up the ambush. Um, you guys familiar with ambushes at all or the different types of ambushes? We talk about the U-shaped ambush or the circular ambush in staff because when you think about it, if you're in a circle, you're going to shoot each other. But usually it's an L-shaped ambush that... Um, Set up, uh, this is pretty much a classical L-shaped ambush. You have a security element here, and also here. The enemy is moving into it. Once they enter into your kill zone, they really don't have a way out. If you've constructed it correctly, you might use things like uh, terrain, natural winding drift and such. Uh, we were doing some work against an Australian unit at, when I was an uh, infantry lieutenant. So we had several hours that we could set up our ambush. In the area, there's a large field out here, we want to bring them down through a choke point on a trail. And we found old pieces of con. You guys know what concertina wire is? Okay, concertina is a small accordion that you see in movies. It's, it's a, a little box with keys in the end, you can open and close it. It makes move music like an accordion, yes? How do you spell concertina? Oh, man. <laughs> C 
C-O-N-C-E-R-T-I-N-A underline spell check. <laughs> That's how I was. I, I think. Uh, but a concertina is a small musical instrument that's like an accordion. Concertina wire is like, a, you ever seen a slinky? Okay, imagine a slinky that's about this big of diameter and has bob wire all over it. That You get caught up in concertina, it hurts. And so we found old elements of concertina around the area we're in because there's a lot of concertina on the military post we're out. And we just drug it out and we started laying a little bit out of here and a little bit out here little bit out here. So it looked like it had been left there from previous exercises. So you deal with people's tendencies of they're walking along, they see it, so they're going to move around. And it's without them realizing we were pushing them into our kill zone. And they kept moving down. Now we had uh, some Claymore mines. These are all simulators, of course. We're, we're going to kill the Australians that we had set up. Claymore mines in the back of a couple trees here. And the kill zone was large enough to where when these would have gone off, they were going to spray this way and not hit us. We waited until that unit because I'll talk about uh, uh, movement techniques in a minute, that we wanted to get the max amount of them into the kill zone. Then we had a uh, signal for kicking it off. Uh, the actual Ambush, as I recall, didn't kick off the way we thought it would. It was supposed to be open fire. But when the snake came across the back of the guy's leg in front of me and I yelled, holy crap, that kind of started the, it was a big snake. And I'm afraid of snakes. Mm -hmm. We're there in a high position. This thing's moving along and it was a, it was a big snake. Yeah, and that started the, that started the uh, ambush. In fact, one guy got up and was not, really not part of the ambush. I found out though if you take an M16, which we were using at the time, with a blank adapter, and you point at a snake's head and pull the trigger, it will blow the snake's head off because it did. <laughs> Other than that one guy kind of jumping around, kind of admin, we did pull off a pretty good objective. We had grenade simulators that were going out, a lot of smoke. The thing you're taught if you're on the receiving end of an ambush, if you walk into an ambush and they open fire on you, if the people have done their ambush correctly, there really is no way to escape. They have the back door closed. There could be mines back out in here. Things have been done that you're in a kill zone. If you're stupid enough, harsh word, if you were stupid enough to walk into an ambush, there's really only one solution, and that is turn towards the fire and attack. That's the weakest place in an ambush. They don't expect that. So if you walk into an ambush, and that's me, I feel fire from there, odds are I'm going to take wounds anyway, turn towards that fire and open up and rush it, you might have a chance of winning. Uh, there's also linear ambushes like along the road. The thing is you want to establish a kill zone, you want it to be not obvious, you want to kill as many people as possible. After the killing is done, you go down, uh, Geneva Convention dictates you administer first aid to those are dead, but you're also gathering as much info intel. You know, do they have radios, frequencies, code books, maps, things like that? I'm going to back up and talk about movement techniques. Since you're in the Air Force, you're going to be flying around a battlefield, but it'd be nice to know. Yes? Um, when you're in an ambush, is there a specific time considered like the combat time? Because if the Geneva Convention administers that you give first aid to any enemy that's not dead already. It kind of defeats the purpose. I can't go any further. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> gotcha. Um. When I started talking, I realized I was going to talk about movement techniques, and I didn't. Remember yesterday I talked about the rifle squad, the you know, actually fire team being the smallest maneuver element in the Army.
that's a rifle squad in movement, and you can't see it too well on the camera, I'm sorry. You have a team leader and a five-man wedge formation squad leader, second five-man formation. The intent is while moving, whether you're using vehicles or you're walking along, <laughs> walking along is to make contact with the enemy with the smallest force possible. And a wedge gives that possibility. Imagine if we're walking through a thickly forested area, you want to maintain visual contact with the people around you, so your wedge might start to collapse. In fact, at some points, especially during night operations, your wedge turns into a single file. But if you're out walking across an open area, which you really wouldn't want to do, but if you had to, you're going to open that wedge out to where you can still maintain hand contact, I, I mean hand and eye contact, hand signals, eye contact with folks out there to give signals to, to stop, down, look there, whatever, without, you don't want to be yelling, you really don't want to use your radios if you can avoid it. That's where standard operating procedures within the squad for movement techniques. So as you're moving along and you come to an area that you could be not an open field but open forest here in Arizona, a lot of forest, the scrubs out so you've got good visibility through, you open that out because you're wanting to not be so close together that a burst of enemy fire or a hand grenade can take out more than one person. Once you are moving along to make contact with, uh, with the enemy, you're going to hold them with that front team and the squad leader is going to move the other team around and try to develop and come in on the flank. <coughs> That's basic wedge formation. You'll see it in vehicles also if you ever see aerial photographs of armor units moving along through open area. They're in kind of a web, uh, wedge formation. We used to fly our Cobras in kind of a wedge formation. And we developed something else because of the train called uh, uh, a free cruise. I'll, I'll show you guys that in a little bit. Now there's three methods of movement. They are traveling, which basically I drew there traveling overwatch and bounding overwatch. Traveling is what you use when you want to move from one point to another point quickly and enemy contact is not likely. And you just continue to increase the gaps between the people and you move as quickly as you can, as quietly as you can, using stealth. You don't want to be making, you need to get that filled? No. Oh, okay. You, you don't want to, you don't want to try to make a lot of noise rattling through the bush if you can avoid it, but you want to move quickly. Speed is of the essence. I mean, the, the, the elements that you must know on the ground, the three things always in anything you do is shoot, move, and communicate. As a military organization, you're a weapon system. Me with a rifle, I'm a weapon system in a sense, so I must be able to shoot. So my weapon must be filled with ammunition, I've got to be able to sight it and use it correctly, I've got to be able to move because I'm no good here if you need me there. As I'm moving, you've got to be able to communicate. So traveling allows rapid movement across the battlefield. Traveling overwatch is where enemy contact is possible, but not likely. You open up your movement and someone is always being covered by someone else. You see a little bit more movement, but you're out in the lead element. I've got overwatch on you, but I'm moving also. The last one is bounding overwatch. Bounding overwatch is either enemy contact is likely or you are in enemy contact. And it's kind of a leapfrogging. I set up a, a position. I'm, I've got safety. I've got some cover, perhaps conce or concealment, perhaps some cover. And I am bringing down uh, suppressive fire on the enemy. I keep their head pinned down so my other squad can move forward and bound forward. No bound. When you're in contact, we used to use the, the, the uh, standard of a three second rush. Break contact, come forward three inches, or <laughs> three seconds, drop back down. And it's almost like the fire thing you stop, drop, and roll. Once you come back down, you drop to the ground and roll left or right. Try not to do it the same both times because if you keep doing that, they, oh, he's always rolling right, he's always rolling right. But you want to not poke yourself back up where you went down. So that bounding unit rushes forward, drops down, sets up, now they open up fire. And now element A will now bound forward. And it's just a leapfrog to where you're trying to keep the enemy pinned down while you can get a position of numerical or fire superiority over him. The thing is, with all the movement techniques, as you're moving along, you, you also want to have your indirect fire ready to support you, whether it's an organic 
uh, M203 grenade launcher, which can be used like a 40 millimeter mortar, or your mortar uh, sections with you can do a hip shoot, you've got artillery. As you move along your route, you have target reference points keyed in to where I'm coming up on a road intersection, I'm not sure, but I've got that surveyed in. If I catch fire or I need fire support, I can use that road intersection as a reference point, target reference point, and shift fires off of that to suppress enemy if they're engaging me. Yes? Just kind of going back a little bit, how do you avoid an ambush? How do you avoid an ambush? Why? <coughs> Stay healthy. <coughs> Pardon me, I really apologize for this. <coughs> this stuff's down in my lungs and it kind of tickles. If I take a breath the wrong way, it starts to flutter and I apologize. <coughs> One thing on the ambush is try to go where they don't think you'll go. Uh, what we did when I was setting up that particular ambush that I drew here in the board that I point to a board There's nothing there. It's stupid um, We knew a general axis advance of the enemy and we did things to kind of influence his movement to us So you try to break that tradition or that convention Also look at the map and go wow if I were going to ambush me How would I do it? How would I do it? And you kind of think through that, wow, this is a key terrain piece. I want to avoid that. And trying to out think and there's like anything, there's no one hundred percent cure or but you want to minimize, you know, that uh, um, you don't take unnecessary gambles. It's like if you come um, are you familiar with the term linear danger area? Okay, you're moving along, come to a road, railroad track. It's a linear danger area because it's a road and you gotta cross it and it might be under observation. If you come to an area that would be, man, if I were going to ambush someone, I'd do it here. You can avoid it, or instead of going across the linear drainage area, is there a, a culvert or you know, a drainage system I can go underneath and get around it, trying to avoid areas of risk. Um, that, that's about the best I can come up with. Um, that it's just trying to think it through and not being stupid or sloppy in how you move forward. I mean, you only, you only got one life per person assigned to you and you want to protect those. They're, I mean, uh, combat operations is a risky business. The intent of the enemy is to kill you and you're trying to subdue him and usually by killing him. Um, you uh, um, try to think through and eliminate. There are some times you cannot avoid going into harm's way. I must go this way. There's no other way around it. That's it. Uh, but trying to work around or use combat multipliers. Can I put some, can I do a reconnaissance by fire using artillery or you know, like that? Did that answer it for you? Yeah, it okay. You had a question too, or were you just stretching? I was just stretching. Sir. Okay, darn it, I had another question. Um, I'm kind of about, talking about moving techniques. Something that we used to do with aircraft, you think about a Cobra, that's my reference point, 10,000 pound aircraft makes a lot of noise because of the way the blades whop on the earth and all that or on the air as you're flying along and so you're moving across the battlefield it could be a forested terrain it could be valleys it could be desert I mean it's but you're trying to minimize risk so uh, attack helicopter company we used to work with things it goes back to the old cavalry that um, the scout aircraft were the whites the attack aircraft were the reds and the Blue's platoon were the reconnaissance element, so red, white, and blue. Attack teams started being called pink teams because red and white together makes pink. So if you've got a uh, it's a scout aircraft. That's a pink team, two Cobras and one Scout. That's a light team. When you have uh, uh, light, light teams, usually one Scout, two guns, three guns, and one Scout's a heavy team. But if you've got a flight of aircraft that are moving from a rear area line, <coughs> um, 
in aviation, we had contour flight, terrain flight, and nap of the earth flight. Um, if you're in the rear area coming forward, you see like aircraft fly around. The risk is just like I talked about the ground techniques of traveling, traveling overwatch, and bounding overwatch. We had the same thing in aviation. Nap of the earth was varying altitudes, varying airspeed, very slow, sometimes less than five knots. You're basically low crawling your helicopter through the trees. Um, the Cobra, seen front on, again, I'm not a artist, so these are just rough graphic representations. That's a Cobra. Kind of. Pretty pathetic. Um, but we could be sitting down amongst the trees and you'd have a a tree like this, and a tree like this, and you're sitting between the trees with the fuselage, and the rotor system's not hitting the trees. That's how down in the trees we'd be. If it was legal for us to open up the canopy when we're at uh, operating island, we could reach out and grab pine cones off the trees. I think somebody did that, but I can't say. <laughs> Actually, I came back from a flight and gave my instructor pilot a pine cone. <laughs> He's going to give me a no-nose check right for violation of that. But, um, I've come back with leaves and branches and the tow missile launchers and the Cobra. Not because we're flying fast the trees, but we're just down into it. The closer you can get in the trees, the more safety you have. Um, but when you're back towards the rear, coming from division rear up into the forward assembly areas where you'll start doing the nap of the earth, you're wanting to move along quickly. And we would do something we called free cruise. If this is your lead aircraft, you imagine an arc, an arc, 90 degrees, 45 degrees, either side of the tail of the aircraft. Check. And okay, this is the direction of flight. Direction of flight is this way. So 45 degrees either side. Aircraft number two could function anywhere in here as long as he never busted the 45. He could be right up on the, the back of the aircraft. He could be back here two miles. I mean, it was, as long as you stayed within that 90 degree span, 45 degrees either side of the tail. Next aircraft back, same thing. Anywhere in that area. And on and on and on. Imagine seven aircraft flying that way as you're coming along. I've been on the ground with a, a company of Cobras coming over. You could hear them. You could hear the growl of the blades. And by the time they got to, you're in 60 foot tall trees in Germany and you hear the noise coming. And I mean, it's, they make a lot of noise. It, it, it shudders what's going on. You, you don't think of a single helicopter, but the blade system's pretty big. It's beating the air pretty hard. And you're right at treetop levels, you know, screaming wide at close to 190 knots. And one comes by and you go, I'm gonna shoot him. And then the other one's here. And the other one's, I mean, you can't get a, you know, don't want two aircraft to go single mile. That was part of your survivability. And it's pretty impressive to watch from above to see uh, a company of Cobras coming up and they're just all moving. It looks like there's, it looks like it's cacophony. There is no, there's no order to it at all when in fact there is. As long as you're staying within that 45 degree or 90 degree span, moving back and forth. It's if you just poured water over the hillside where the water goes, it flows and all that, and you watch them come in. And uh, we, we were doing exercises, testing out some of this, these movement techniques. Uh, you guys know what MILES is? Multiple Integrated Laser Engagement System? Basically, Army laser tag. Um, soldiers, you wore it. If you see somebody in evaluation, you'll see a guy wearing a helmet has these, like a band around his helmet has little bumps on it. Those are the those are the laser receivers. There's a strap that goes down. All the different vehicles in the army had them too: tanks, uh, wheeled vehicles, uh, armored personnel carriers, aircraft. On a ground vehicle, if you're engaged, like in the way the miles was set up. That if I took an M16 or an M4 and I pointed it at a, at a tank and pulled the trigger, in real life, that bullet's going to ricochet off. Using miles, it's going to give a chirp to the tank crew going, somebody's firing at us, but doesn't kill it. 
you know, start looking around, where's that idiot with the M16? And when they open up with their coaxial, uh, you're dead, likely. But if you engage the tank with the appropriate weapon system, like an anti-tank weapon, and you hit it, it kills the engine, the light starts flashing, and a red smoke canister goes off. Well, they put those on helicopters too, but they didn't put the kill in there for obvious reasons. But it would, the smoke would go off, the light would flash, and you're supposed to have to land. And we found when we used that free cruise technique against the miles where well, miles was being fielded, and we were, uh, the United States in Germany were fielded and trying it out. And a couple things we did one is the truck came on, you take the box it in, and you dropped it from the truck to the ground and see if it still worked. That was part of the, is a true proof, you know, this stuff is, is fragile stuff, but it's packed correctly. That was part of the testing. We wired everything up. The air defense guys with their Vulcans uh, had, had the uh, uh, system on it. And we had it to where we could fire back. And we were uh, very survivable. The weapon systems designed to take us down had trouble getting us. We took one aircraft, had some damage. It was like second or third shot back, but it was slick as we, as, as we received, I say we, I wasn't flying in that mission. I was one of the guys, um, if I test evaluators. But the aircraft was engaged. They had to go set it down because it had been damaged in flight. But the back half of the flight wheeled around and took out the Vulcan system. And it's, uh, then the, the final bit was the, the division was evaluating the division tactical operations center. We found it. And we did a with every attack helicopter pilot the light is. We did a strafing run on the division and lit them all up. But anyway, um, the movement techniques are pretty cool, um, which probably is boring the hell out of you guys. So I apologize. Uh, I'm digging into patrolling. We're just about out of time. Yes, sir. Did you ever do the miles yourself? Yes. Did you like it? It was good. Yeah, it's. Uh, <coughs> It got to be a pain to, to wear that crap around, excuse me, that stuff around, because it's more stuff you're wearing on your body out in the field. It adds a couple pounds to the helmet and all this stuff. I was just like, oh, man. But it was, um, when I was new in the Army, we had a system called scopes training. And if you were force on force, you put on helmet camouflage covers that had numbers on the side. And some numbers, um, it's a black circle with a green number. Others were brown circles with kind of light yellow numbers, and you'd have to go, I see black 23. Oh, yeah, black 23 is dead. Well, okay. And you have a little scope on your M16. So you can look through the scope. And it... So imagine a tree and a guy putting his head behind the tree and cheating. You know? So it eliminated that. Or if you've ever played uh, Army soldier growing up, I shot you first. No, I shot you first. The early reforger exercises, we had green force against orange force. The orange force, every vehicle had to have a number on it. It was orange panel with black numbers. The blue force was blue panels with white numbers. And if you had an engagement, you had to look through your optics and go, I see orange 57. And okay, orange 57, what grid? A grid, blah, 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 blah. It looks to be three tanks and two APCs I engaged with five Cobras. Roger, you got a kill, you know, kind of slow. So the miles got rid of that, made it a little bit more dynamic. I mean, a kill was a kill. And they had, I don't want to offend anyone, they had something called the God Gun. And the evaluators would walk around, it was a gun, and it would kill anything. And you're dead. <laughs> nah, you're dead too. And if you were in an ambush or something happened or... Um, when we were at uh, Fort Irwin, uh, Red Flag, which is the Air Force um, version of Top Gun, um, because uh, Nellis Air Force Base is near Fort Irwin, they would come over and provide uh, close air support or any mean close air support, such like that. So they'd come by and do a run on us, and the evaluators would come through, let's see, you're dead, and you're dead, and you're dead, you know, or, or you're wounded, you know. <laughs> kind of set phase of the stun. Um, but it, it did get rid of the tag you're in or I shot you first. Um, we used it on larger exercises uh, because it took a lot to put everything on. Imagine, you know, this is being wired onto an aircraft from tail to nose, and you've got blades that spin around that are creating rotor, rotor wash, and you're worried about stuff shaking loose. So it's got to really be, it takes a while, though, to rig up a vehicle so it doesn't cause damage to the vehicle or the equipment. 
I wasn't hearing things, okay. Um, but it, it was good for uh, what we're doing because it did, it did eliminate the who shot who first. Um, it's, it's good. I mean, it's, it, I'll be honest, there was one point I was out in the field, I was so glad to hear mine go off because then I could sit there and take my helmet off for me. No, come back here, you're alive again, get back in there. Oh, darn it, you know, and all that. Um, it's, it is a, just a, a very military recognized high end laser tag system to be used by any vehicle in your army and, and such. Um, do you have a question? No. Any question? No. I see people moving their hands. Like, Questions, please. <laughs> please, question. No. I'm, I'm, I'm struggling here that last night I was about like this when I talked. And my wife and son were very happy because I couldn't talk last night. And the boys started coming back today. Uh, I was trying to, one of the classes I was monitoring to give him push ups. And, time! 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 So I'm going, ooh, thank you. You know, and it's, uh, when you make your living talking, it kind of sucks when you lose your voice. Tomorrow, I promise we'll talk about BCTs and we'll wrap everything back together, but you can understand and show you how the Army used to fight and how they're fighting now. That, um, you know, let's face it, our, our country, when you look at we've done a war against a major opponent, and we, they choose to, like Saddam was saying, let's put a big armored force out there and we're going to take you on and you know, whoop its tail in less than 100 hours. We have more trouble dealing with insurgencies, but that's the nature of war these days. That uh, insurgency forces have been around like forever, and you have to fight insurgency with counterinsurgency. And uh, if you study the books and you see that when the surge happened in Iraq under General Petraeus, you know, he had a strong counterinsurgency background, and he looked at lessons from history. And he went in and started fighting the insurgents in Iraq with true, almost by the book, counterinsurgency uh, tactics. And we showed good really results. Uh, anyway, let's go ahead and shut this down for the day. And we'll see.